Okay, it's now three o'clock, so I can start the Sutta class. Once everybody is sitting comfortably, and because these are the word of the Buddha, I usually just put my hands up and do a little chant to begin with. Namo tasa bhagavato alahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato alahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato Alahato Sama Sambuddhasa. So I'm continuing on with the word of the Buddha, and you may remember that this is. Can you see over there, L? Okay, you can. Okay, you got eyes round. We can go see round corners. <laughs> so in this uh, series of the word of the Buddha. Uh, these are translations of key teachings of the Buddha, all from the suttas, uh, which put together uh, the basic teaching of the Buddha, the Four Noble Truths and Eightfold Path. And the translations are very much based on the suttas, but for those of you who have heard me teach before, it tries to take away all the repetition and also to uh, sometimes change similes uh, such as uh, what I described when I was giving uh, some sutta classes over in Thailand last week, uh, was that we have similes like just as somebody washes a cloth. In the suttas they say just like they wash the cloth in cow uh, dung and then they dry it and it still has the smell of the cow dung afterwards. Now, of course, those of you who have heard me say about a simile like that before, that's just how people used to wash in those days. That was common. But if you uh, relate that simile now, all that people remember is just the strangeness of washing things in cow dung. So instead of the simile which you find in the suttas, I adapted that simile to say just as you wash them, uh, a robe or something in a washing machine and then after you take it out and it's dried you can still smell the the washing powder but then after a while you hang it up and the washing powder just fades away so it's the same meaning but just changing similes uh, to ways in which modern people would just see the the main meaning of the simile and not get distracted by the idiosyncrasies of how people wash clothes in the past so it is different than ordinary translations, but still 100% accurate. And the second thing which uh, I do in these translations, you see there are, have been some terms uh, in English, you know, things like um, concentration or meditation or, or uh, stillness, my preferred translation. And even here, the second factor of the Eightfold Path, Sama Sankapa. And I've seen so many different uh, translations or renderings of the word Sankapa. And uh, my preferred uh, rendering is motivation, where one is coming from uh, in one's actions of body, deed, and even thoughts. And I'll explain that in a few moments. But nevertheless, these are uh, translations which are far more meaningful. And I was talking to somebody even last night uh, at their house that all these uh, words, you know, things like mindfulness, right view, concentration, these words have all come, you know, from mostly from Professor Rice Davids over a hundred years ago, one of the first people who was doing translations from the Party Text Society. And they kind of stuck. Some of those translations are excellent. Some of them are quite... Uh, unuseful. So that's why I've trans changed some of the translations and I hope you can see the meaning for that. So anyway, uh, in this series of talks, and this is going to be the last one for a while because uh, the last month of the range retreat, or the outside the range retreat, 
uh, is going to be sutra classes done by Ajahn uh, uh, Bamali and Ajahn Sujata. So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to go through the second factor of the Eightfold Path, the right motivation, it's not that long. And then I'm going to skip some things. Uh, because when we talk about the right uh, speech, action, livelihood, those three factors, most people understand what that means. And especially if you can understand it as based on right motivation. And right motivation based on the right view which comes before. So these eight factors of the Eightfold Path from right view, right motivation, right speech, action, livelihood, and then this uh, seventh or sixth factor of the Eightfold Path. Usually people call it right effort. I really don't like that term. It's not that I'm a lazy monk. You look at my lifestyle, and I don't think I qualify to be a lazy monk. Uh, but it is something which is more like right restraint. And here in this uh, series, I called it right endeavor. But I kind of prefer these days the word restraint or renunciation. But anyway, uh, this is the second factor of the Eightfold Path, right motivation. And of course, it's based on the first factor of the Eightfold Path, you know the right view. Once a person has a correct view of the nature of themselves and of existence, they will obviously make your motivations, where you're coming from, much more in line with the Dhamma. So here we go. This is the second factor of the Eightfold Path. Nothing much is written about it, but here is what's written. What now is right motivation? Actions of body, speech and mind arising from a motive of renunciation, arising from a motive of kindness, or arising from a motive of gentleness. This is called right motivation. And of course, I will pause there because this is fundamental to one's life as a Buddhist, one's meditation as a Buddhist, one's whole practice as a Buddhist. Whatever you do by body, speech and mind, you make sure it's coming from a place, a motive of, uh, of renunciation, not accumulating things, but letting go of things, not amassing more um, awards or attainments, but disappearing more. Not sort of getting more and more certificates to put on your wall, but having less of a wall to put any certificates on. And that idea of renunciation is paramount. And I also must keep on reminding myself and others of what Ajahn Chah taught me. Even when you meditate, you don't meditate to get some things. You don't meditate trying to attain sort of uh, awareness of the breath, or attain the experience of nimittas, or to attain jhanas. If you try that path of trying to attain something, you'll find yourself getting very, very frustrated. Because this is not a, par a path of attainment, it's a part of renunciation. When you're meditating, the more you let go of, the easier the, the things like nimittas and jhanas happen. They happen when you've let go a lot. The more you've let go, even temporarily, you're sitting there, you don't want anything in the whole world. That is when these deep meditations happen. And that's one of the reasons why, when people sort of tell me about some of the first times they experience some of these deep meditations, what was the cause of it? And so often it's because they did just give up, let go, stop trying. They renounced. They didn't want anything in the world. Their sense of self and ego, the thing which does the attaching, started to disappear. And that's when these deep meditations happen. So from a motive of renunciation, arising from a motive of kindness. And again, kindness is, is a soft word. It's a soft word which everybody thinks they can be kind, but few people really know what kindness is. And when I gave a talk on Friday night, I hope people heard, apparently it was 
not, didn't get uh, out onto the internet very easily, but it doesn't matter. You can always say the thing again. Uh, but that m kindness, to actually know what it really is, one way you can know what kindness is, if you really are kind to your body, your body relaxes and gets very healthy and aches and pains disappear. Kindness is very, very, very powerful. And it, it's not just something which comes from you. Other people can feel it when you practice kindness. And the gentleness is another beautiful part of this second factor of the Eightfold Path, which we forget about many times. Many times in our life, we just go for it. Come on, put forth some effort. Just, we don't just fall asleep when Ajahn Brahm's giving a talk. Stay awake. Have you ever heard me say that? <laughs> of course you don't, because the gentleness is what works. And gentleness is something which is quite rare in this world. People are very, very aggressive, forceful. And even some meditation teachers can be aggressive and forceful. And even when I was a young monk, that never made much sense to me. And this, is that real Buddhism, to be harsh? and to keep on shouting at people like you're some coach of a football team. If you don't score a goal, you're going to get sacked. That's not gentleness. And so the path of Buddhism is this beautiful, and I say it beautiful because this is what a Buddhist path should be. You know, even though it's not attained to close to enlightenment yet, still it should have this beautiful quality to it which attracts people and inspires people. Even if you can't do it, you can feel this is important and you can aspire to something like uh, renunciation and kindness and gentleness. And in my life, of course, people say, that's okay, even a monastery, but what in the real world? And I often say, first of all, what do you mean the monastery is the real world? Now, in a monastery, we don't sort of use wigs or transplants or uh, what is deodorants. As we are, that's how we smell. <laughs> so anyway, so what is the real world? So when one understands that, you know, these things actually do work in a real world, it's just the real world which you live in is not really the real world. Too many reals there. Anyway, uh, the sense of gentleness and kindness and renunciation, that forms part of the second factor of the Eightfold Path. And that's, uh, it is important. You may think it's simple, but when you do do things like gentleness, one thing which gentleness includes in my understanding is also patience, softness, slowness. Because when you rush, that's not gentle at all. And that sort of slowness, the ability to sit there and however long it takes, that's good enough for me. That type of gentleness is part of this right motivation. And of course, they don't say much about right motivation in the suttas, but what they do say is kind of interesting, so I've included it in here. This is the, the MN means a Majjhima 78th Sutta. What are the wrong motivations? They are motivations of desire concerning the world of the five senses instead of renunciation. Desire concerning the world of the five senses. They are motivations of aversion and of cruelty. Those are the opposite of those uh, uh, three right motivations. And when you have the opposite, you do get a better picture of what those three things are, which are right motivation. Renunciation means renouncing, again, the desire concerning the world of the five senses. You know exactly what those world of the five senses can give you, and you aren't totally caught up uh, with dealing with the world of the five senses. And of course, aversion. Instead of loving kindness, sometimes people have aversion, which again does not lead to anything which is 
very useful. And the loving kindness, it's amazing just how that caring can heal people. And just the aversion, you feel that if you have aversion for something, you can get rid of it, and when you get rid of it, you're free. But that doesn't work that way. Uh, more things which cause aversion come into your life. And the cruelty, instead of the gentleness, even just being impatient is being quite cruel to nature. Nature doesn't work that way. You can try and force nature, you can force a flower to bud when you want to see it uh, blossom. But that is being cruel to nature. And now this is what uh, is the source of wrong motivations. They arise from perceptions of desire concerning the world of the five senses. Like uh, basically distorted perceptions concerning the world of the five senses, a reversion of cruelty. And this is just one slightly interesting thing. It's not really core to uh, what uh, we're trying to do here to describe right motivations. But it says, where does the wrong motivation cease without remainder? And they cease in the first jhana. And what does that actually mean? It means in that jhana, the perceptions of desire concerning the world of the five senses are let go of, and aversion and cruelty are also let go of. They don't exist within that first jhana. And what are the right motivations? They are the motivations of renunciation, kindness and gentleness. And what is the source of these right motivations? Uh, they arise from perceptions of renunciation, kindness and gentleness. And uh, this is the perceptions. We work with the perceptions and find out that the perceptions of renunciation, kindness and gentleness, those are the ones which actually inspire us. And they just are motive. <laughs> motivators to motivate. But those perceptions, they actually start to uh, develop the motivations. And this last little sentence, where do these right motivations cease without remainder? And they cease in the second jhana. Why is that? It is because uh, in that second jhana, the first jhana is noted by the absence of the world of the five senses. You are just uh, separated from that, secluded from that, as the Buddha said. But in the second jhana, there one is secluded from will. That will, which is uh, part of the motivation, that is also gone. So it's just an interesting little piece there. If you understand what the first and second jhana are, you can understand why that was included in there. But it doesn't really add too much to the description of right, right, um, uh, right renunciation and not renunciation, yeah, yeah renunciation and uh, kindness and gentleness. Now that's all they say about this right motivation. But hopefully you can see that once there is right motivation there, the way you're coming from is pure, then that will automatically lead to the right speech, action and livelihood. You can't do anything else because it's your motivation is pure. Now, to make it more interesting what uh, I'm saying today, I'm going to scroll a long way up. So, scroller, keep on scrolling until almost the very end. On my page, okay, I'm keeping on going. Where you got from the Anguta, I think it's called. Almost at the bottom, past Jhana, past Nibbana past the gradual training, past from the Anguttara. See if I can find it here. Here's one. 
right at the very end. It's mm. 10, 103, the wrong course. Can you find that? You're pretty close to yeah. Okay, I have it on page 61. You got it there. Well done. Okay, now this is from the Anguttara in Nikaya. And this is called the wrong course. And meditators, in dependence on the wrong course, there is failure, not success. For one of wrong view, wrong motivation originates. For one of wrong motivation, wrong speech originates. One of wrong speech, wrong action originates. One of wrong action, wrong livelihood originates. For one of wrong livelihood, wrong endeavor, I, more like I call it wrong restraint these days, originates. For one of wrong endeavor, wrong mindfulness originates. For one of wrong mindfulness, wrong stillness originates. This is samadhi. For one of wrong stillness, wrong knowledge originates. For one of wrong knowledge, wrong liberation originates. In this way, in dependence on the wrong course, there is failure, not success. And put in the other way around, in dependence on the right course, there is success, not failure. For one of right view, right motivation originates. That's what I said earlier, that once the view is good, then the motivation of renunciation, uh, kindness and gentleness happens. That's where it comes from. For one of right motivation, right speech originates. One of right speech, right action originates. Why do they have the speech first and then the action? Because we have also what precedes even action is that thinking, that verbalization of what you're going to do, which is a more refined, like mental speech. And that's why speech leads to right action. Right action leads to light livelihood right livelihood, then this right endeavor happens. And the reason I was doing this, because I'm going to go past right as uh, speech, action, and livelihood, and go right to this right endeavor, Samawayama. This is my last um, uh, time to teach this before the range retreat finishes. For one of right restraint, right mindfulness originates. For one of right mindfulness, has to come from restraint. Jhana originates from one of jhana, right knowledge originates from one of right knowledge, right liberation of knowledge. Right liberation originates. In this way, independence on the right course of success, not failure. You okay there? Any questions on that so far? If not, we've got to do some more scrolling. Go scroll back up. The page, it's quite a long way. Just before the mind first. A bit further, uh, close to it. So number six and it's on page, right endeavor I've got called, called here. Where's the page numbers? 35? 35 or 34? Yeah, 35. No, 34. You're close. A bit more. There we go. Now a bit more. Yeah, a bit further up. A bit further up, almost there, yes, yours on 33, okay. Right endeavor. So this is jumping from the right motivation over speech, action, livelihood to the sixth factor of the Eightfold Path. It's called Samawayama. And for many years I've been trying to find a decent translation for Wayama. 
other than things like effort or striving. Because you know that if you have too much effort and striving, even just a small amount of effort and striving, you are never going to have that sense of inner freedom, that peace which is uh, necessary for even practicing mindfulness and certainly for experiencing the stillness of the mind in deep meditation, which is always really, really important. So I called it endeavor first of all, but really I think these days I'm going to be calling it restraint instead. The reason I call it restraint is, for those of you who know this path to enlightenment, it's usually uh, described as the Eightfold Path, but then we also have something we call the gradual training. And in gradual training, in the place of this sixth factor, we have the restraint, the right restraint. And to actually to match those two paths together, which cannot be a different path to enlightenment, but a different way of expressing the same path, the same practice, to gradual training or the Eightfold Path. That's where I feel that the restraint really fits in here. But in order to understand why I say this, let's actually just listen to how the Buddha explained right restraint. Remember, this is happening after the body, the actions of, um, of speech, actions and livelihood. They come from the right motivation, which comes from the right view. And then they're going to lead to this fact of the Eightfold Path. There are these four right endeavors. That's why I didn't, didn't kind of still struggle with restraint, because the first one we call restraint anyway. Restraint, abandonment, development, pers preservation. So the endeavor of restraint. And what is the endeavor of restraint? When you see an object, you do not let yourself get sucked in by any characteristics or features that generate defilements. And even just that word, to get sucked in, you don't see that in any uh, old translations, but it's a very decent word because that's how we explain things these days when people get sucked into something. You, when you see an object, you do not let yourself get sucked in by any characteristics or features that generate defilements. Since if you left a faculty of sight unrestrained, unskillful states of wanting and aversion would afflict you. Instead, you practice wisdom when seeing. You guard the faculty of sight and you undertake the restraint of sight. And the same with the other senses. Having heard a sound, having noticed a smell, having sensed a taste, having felt a bodily feeling, even having cognized something with the mind, you do not let yourself get sucked in by any characteristics or features that generate defilements. Since you've left, if you left the mind faculty unrestrained, unskillful states of wanting and aversion would affect you, it would afflict you. Instead, you practice wisdom with the mind. You guard the mind and you undertake the restraint of the mind. This is what restraint means. It's a much deeper form of virtuous conduct. It's we have the, the, the virtues of our precepts, but the virtue of sense restraint goes even deeper. And it's not that hard a thing to practice you just make sure that you know you don't go looking around for something to distract yourself. You don't go listening for sounds. A lot of times that, I know just some of the stories which I remember practicing as a young monk. Remember whenever I would go on arms round, I was always taught by Ajahn Chah to keep your eyes down on the ground. Maybe just a body length in front of you, just as you train when you're doing walking meditation. And so when I did things like that, you went walking in the, in the village or in the town sometimes, and that's what I did, and my eyes a few meters in front of me. And then when somebody offered things in your bowl, you just looked actually inside of your bowl. You never looked to the face of the person offering food. And I do recall what happened. Uh, 
many times. There's one time, I remember in the town of Roy Et in Thailand, after the arms round finished, the head monk there said, oh, did you see there was a Westerner there that gave you alms food? Really? I never saw her. And I was actually quite pleased about that because I was restrained. I was just looking in my bowl or looking in, in, uh, in front of me. And there was this American girl, apparently, and she put food in my bowl. I didn't even recognize her. And the opposite of that is a few times uh, you went into parts of Thailand where no Westerners had, had ever been before. I remember doing that because what happened, went in this town and then I was obviously a white monk. I was about six years as a monk by that time. And when I was walking into the village, then people had you know, the sticky rice to put into your bowl. But then, they're not supposed to look at me when they put food in the bowl. But this was the first time they'd seen a white man, let alone a white monk. And I remember just many of these ladies, you could see I was watching inside my bowl, and you could actually see the hand drop the rice, and it fell outside the bowl. They weren't paying attention at all. <laughs> they were just quite surprised and shocked to see a white monk. But anyway, at least I knew, and maybe I may have gone a little bit hungry that day, but the dogs in the village were so happy. They got so, so much to eat, just around the side there. And I know that one of those ladies, surprise, surprise, is one of these uh, ladies, she said that she, when she was growing up in a village in the northeast of Thailand, she saw a white monk coming on arms around in the village and she, she did the same, everyone was too, too excited, too shocked and they dropped the food outside the bowl instead of in the bowl. And when I checked with her, quite likely, that was me she saw so many years ago, and now she comes to live in Perth. Anyway, and I, I, I really think that's a great possibility or probability, because not many white monks went in that area. <sighs> and so, that becomes the effort of sense restraint, which means your mind doesn't get stirred up. It remains cool and calm throughout the day. And when you can do things like that, of course, your mind will have an inner peace. It's much deeper than just the virtue of right speech, action and livelihood. And what are you doing that for? You're coming from places of renunciation, motives of kindness, motives of gentleness. Sometimes I think, is that really being kind? When you don't see somebody and say, hello, how are you? In the West we have to do that, say, hello, how are you? Or well, really do we? Sometimes, yes. But isn't it wonderful to see somebody who is peaceful and calm, who does not need to sort of engage with you with voice, but just to be able to be peaceful and come into your village and have the arms round and just go in like, and come out like some sort of angel, some deva being. And I know that many people prefer that. Peaceful, and they don't need to be told, may you be happy and well. The fact that somebody comes in and sees you, that is expressing the kindness and the gentleness. And that is called the effort to restrain. Restrain the mind so you don't get caught up in things. The endeavor to abandon. What is the endeavor to abandon? Here you do not maintain an arisen motivation of wanting. You abandon it, let it go, renounce it and bring it to cessation. Sometimes we always just want things. You may see some food on the table that which you want at lunchtime, you may have all these other things which you love to have. You may sort of see an advertisement for the lottery. Would you like to win the lottery? <laughs> People say that, but honestly, if you did win that lottery, it would not be what you expect. It would be unfaithful to you. As soon as you have, what was it that case? 
of that lady who won the British lottery, I think 41 million uh, pounds sterling some years ago. And that's you know, tax or you know, tax free or tax had already been paid off once she had the 41 million pounds in cash. And what she decided to do was to buy a big mansion in Sussex. Beautiful part of the world, very expensive, but she didn't have any concern for money anymore. She built this big mansion and she sold it after only one year at a loss. And when they asked, why did you sell this big mansion? You had plenty of money left. And what she replied in the newspaper was, or in the article which I read, that once she had that big idyllic mansion, she never saw her family. There was such a big house. As she said, her husband was in another part of the house. Her kids, one was in their suite of rooms, another kid was in another part of the house. And throughout the whole day, she hardly ever saw her kids. The house was actually separating her family. And what she did, <laughs> is she bought a small house in town a small house, only a few rooms. So she must always see her husband and her kids every day. They couldn't escape from one another. And then I remember when I read that, I read how lucky I was growing up in a small council flat in London and had to share a room with my brother for most of my life until eventually he went to university and then eventually went over to become a monk in Thailand. And many of you may have seen uh, me interact with my brother, Tony, at my 60th birthday here. He came over here and we were interacting so well. When I had to sign my books, he came and stood next to me and signed the books as well. <laughs> he really enjoyed that. <laughs> I didn't mind. But that fact that because you'd grown up together, you got to know one another and love one another, that would never happen if you're in a big mansion. The size of the house separates you. It doesn't bring you together. Imp it does impress the visitors, but it doesn't impress many other people. You lose the family bond of growing up together. I even saw that in just the small villages in Thailand. In the small villages, they say the whole village was a family, which did mean that everybody looked after one another. You couldn't escape. Anyway, you didn't want to escape. It was warm and comforting. So, in arisen, an arisen motivation of wanting, you abandon it, let it go, renounce it, bring it to cessation. You do not indulge in the arisen motivation of aversion and there is a motivation of harming. Whenever bad motivations arise, you abandon them, let them go, renounce them, and bring them to cessation. This is called the endeavor to abandon. So first of all is you don't allow any of these bad things, disturbing things to arise in the first place. If they have arisen, you find ways of letting them go. And this is entirely where the endeavor to abandon, if you try to get rid of bad states of mind, you try that in your meditation. And you'll find that the, the uh, bad states in the meditation which you quite uh, struggle with, you, want to get, you don't want to have thoughts of um, just what you want in this world or uh, desires or things you have to do next. Really, all you really want in your meditation is to peace, to be able to let those things go. Is it easy to do that? And this is one of the reasons why the striving, wanting them to go, doesn't usually work. And against that, we have one of my most used similes about how to abandon um, unwholesome, uh, 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 indulge an arisen motivation of wanting aversion or harming, how do you abandon those? And one of the best similes, which I use a lot, is a simile of the, uh, 
the anger-eating monster. And that's one of the reasons I use that simile a lot. If there's a monster causing you great trouble in your meditation, trying to get rid of it, saying, get out of here, you don't belong, usually just makes it worse, it makes it bigger, harder to get rid of. But if you can say to that monster, welcome, not with aversion, but with kindness, with renunciation and with gentleness, then that monster just disappears pretty quickly. And that is just the way of Buddhism. You don't strive to get rid of difficult things. You welcome them, kind to them, and then they get smaller and less of a problem. Even today, talking with somebody who about spirits, ghosts, and they were saying that they were so kind to their ghost in their house, the real sort of spirit, that that ghost started to protect them and be kind to them and look after them, which is usually what happens. Whatever it is, giving it kindness and gentleness, they will care for you and look after you. Even to the point, just as an interesting uh, thing to say, years and years ago, uh, when we first moved into this set of buildings, uh, this uh, guy came to see me. He was Chinese, or Chinese, uh, look, I think it may have been from Malaysia or from Taiwan, Hong Kong, I'm not quite sure. But anyway, he came up to me and said, oh, Ajahn Brahm, I just was asked to see you. I am from the triads in Perth. And I don't know too much about the triads, but I know they're a pretty dangerous group of people. And he only had one. He had one finger, min, uh, one finger missing, and apparently that's what you have to do to join the triads. And he said, "But please, Ajahn Brahm, don't worry, don't be afraid. That you look after the Chinese people here in Perth. And so, because of that, I want to let you know: if you have any problem with anybody, please contact us, and we'll protect you." <laughs> And he was serious, he wasn't a mad fellow, he was actually quite scary. But nevertheless, I always kind of remember this, if you're kind to others, others will always be kind to you. <laughs> Even triads or mafia, or I don't know who else. But that's some of the things which, uh, when you have uh, to get rid of something in your own mind which is causing you trouble, please be kind to it. Be gentle and learn how to renounce things like the future or the past. We call the effort to abandon, but not through force. This is called the effort to abandon. Now they also have uh, another sutta on this endeavor to abandon about unwholesome, afflicting unwholesome motivations connected with desire, aversion and delusion. This is uh, ways to uh, get rid of um, un unhelpful thoughts, unhelpful objects. And in this one, the Buddha said, when you are mindful of some object and there arises in you afflicting, unwholesome motivations connected with desire, aversion, and delusion, then you should give attention to some other object that generates wholesome mind states. Thus, unwholesome mind states are abandoned and subside. With their disappearance, your mind becomes internally steady, settled, unified, and still. This is just when one is meditating especially, but not just meditating. You may be working, you may be driving. If you have attention to some other object that generates disturbance for you, then Push that one aside, see if you can give attention to a, a better object. If that doesn't work, you should examine the danger in those unwholesome uh, motivations. That's one of the in helpful things. When you have a sort of a, a thoughts of, say, lust or wanting or hunger or whatever, is that really going to be helpful for you? Sometimes whenever we are caught up in what we call defilements, we're only seeing part of the story. For many times I've told monks, 
if they are meditating to get thoughts of, say, sensuality, then one way which I used to deal with that was actually to kind of fast forward it and to ask, then what? Then what? Then what? Then what? At first, if I, you, know, you feel it's, oh, you're going to have a bit of fun. But then if you see what happens next, and what happens next, then what happens next, then what happens next, fast forward it, and in the end, you just, uh, you lose all interest in it. You know, simple things, like as a young man, and I've already told you that I used to like playing football as a young kid, played for the school team. If my family and teachers hadn't encouraged me to do my homework instead of go playing football, I could have been a millionaire by now. You've heard, seen how much like footballers earn at, uh, when they play for big clubs. But anyway, I just did the schoolwork instead, so that was the end of that career. But nevertheless, sometimes I remember as a young monk, you started thinking about what would happen if I, I was still very young, I ordained at 23, I could still train up a bit and maybe re resurrect my football career. And then what would happen? Then after resurrecting my f football career, then score a couple of goals for the, the national team, win the World Cup, become rich and become famous. And then there's a lot of excitement in fantasies. And especially because in any fantasy you have of the world or about sex or whatever, you're always in charge and you always come out the winner. In real life, hardly anyone becomes a winner. You can only have one winner. I remember that of all the countries who play in, say, soccer or whatever other sport, only one can ever win, which means everyone else are losers. And I didn't ever want to become a loser at that time. So sometimes when he looked at the fantasy and just fast forward it, then what, then what, then what, it lost a lot of its uh, gloss and, and glisten it became quite boring and basically, so what? So anyway, that um, was the ways. Examine the danger in those unwholesome motives. I remember just one of my fellow monks, he was with another teacher and every morning before the arms round they would sit for two hours in the hall to meditate, and that was quite tough. Sometimes you felt energized, you had a nice strong body, no aches and no pains, and sometimes that was easy to do. But sometimes it was very tough to meditate for two hours in the morning. And often he would be sleepy and struggling with fighting that sleepiness. But on this one day he decided that, okay, I'll just start thinking a fantasy. So he started thinking this romantic fantasy. And then he was surprised he didn't have any sleepiness at all. He had no aches and pains in his body. And the two hours passed so quickly. And then afterwards he thought, wow, two hours have gone without much aches or pains or anything. Because he was fantasizing. But then his teacher there's a problem with having good teachers, sometimes they can read your mind. And so he was scared. He looked up and saw his teacher glaring at him. And his teacher got up from his seat and walked over. And he was so frightened. What's his teacher going to do? He was certain his teacher had read his mind and busted him. And his teacher came over and said to this uh, young monk, he said, you have just been wasting two hours of your time. And then he went away. It was kind of a very powerful statement. It wasn't sort of criticizing him with you know, unkindness. He was still, the teacher was being gentle and kind, but being quite uh, clear. You're wasting your time. And that's one of the biggest danger in just indulging in many of these thoughts and fantasies. If you really did win the lottery, then what? 
then what? Then what? Then what? You may imagine all the stuff you can do, but what about the dangers in having won a lottery? Anyway, or you should try and ignore those unwholesome motives. Do not give attention to them. Or you should give attention to stilling the causes of those motives. Why do a person want anything? That's one of the uh, important insights on how to meditate so you don't get these distracting thoughts which are to do with the five sense world, to do with wanting, aversion or delusion, is actually to learn how, why do I, what do I want? Why do I want it? And you do actually find the reason why we have distractions in our meditation is because our mind just can't stand us. We have what I call the wrong, um, the wrong relationship with our mind. We're always telling our mind what to do and how to do it. And after a while our mind gets fed up with us. And that's one of the reasons why, that one of the great ways of abandoning these things which disturb and defile us is to change the way we regard our body and mind. And instead do it with kindness, with gentleness and with some restraint. That's one of the reasons why when I teach my meditation, I do my meditation, I often ask myself, now body, Ajahn Brahm body, what do you want? What do you need? And I do that with kindness. And because I'm kind and gentle to my own body, it seems to be this is a common sense thing to do. But it's amazing how many people just force their body, train their body, and hurt their body. Because I'm kind to the body, my body has, has a good relationship with me. By saying it's got a good relationship with me, it means that if it hurts, I will move it. If it itches, I'll scratch it. If the uh, cushion needs to be adjusted, I will adjust it. That means the body realizes that it can trust me. And then I can sit down and meditate and the body doesn't need to do anything. It disappears after a while. Or especially the mind. Sometimes, uh, uh, why does the mind wander away? It's because there wasn't enough kindness and gentleness and re renunciation. I always wanted to do something. I want to get rid of things. I want to do this, I want to do that. And after a while, this, my mind looks at me as being a control freak. Now, I've mentioned that simile many times before. This afternoon, once the class is finished, suppose that you received a phone call. And on that phone call, is it working okay? Something's happening. Oh, it's disappeared. See, that's called renunciation. When things disappear, let's go. <laughs> well, then, anyway. Yes, it's back again. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, please, Christy, be kind to the machine. Nice machine, yeah. <laughs> and then it will work for you. No, honestly, that actually does work. That happens so, so many times when you're kind to something. It sometimes, machines work for you. The old cement mixer I used to have for years, and half the monitor was, was built with that cement mixer, it would always work for me. Other monks couldn't get it to work. I could, and I would always, <laughs> would actually stroke it. Nice cement mixer. And because I knew it, I could pull that string and it would work every time. And other monks couldn't do that. Or that time in front of here, that one time when the youth group, we used to call the youth group in those days, 
Now we give all sorts of other names like Be Quiet or KFC or whatever. It's just marketing, it's the same group. But then when they were going after the, the youth group meeting, they were going out to the beach to do something or other, they didn't tell me, but they couldn't get to the beach because they had stuff in the boot of their car and they could not open the boot of their car. And they've been trying for half an hour to open the boot of the car and the lock wouldn't work. They saw me coming from, I'd just gone round the corner to do some chanting for somebody, walking up uh, Nansen Way. And as I came closer, they were still struggling to open the boot of the car and then they said, Ajahn Brahm, please help us. You know, we can't open the boot of the car, but I'm sure you can use your magic powers and open the boot of the car. And I said, I'll open the boot of the car if, because the lady who was asking this, if, you know, it was Ronnie, uh, Indonesian Ronnie. I think you know who that is, yeah. And I said, I will open the boot of that car if you promise to become a bhikkhuni. <laughs> and she looked at me, she was heedless. I said, okay, if you can, they've been trying for half an hour, they never thought I could do it. So I got the key, put it in the lock, turned the lock, opened the boot straight away. <laughs> Ah, she said. <laughs> I really caught her. But then one of the troubles was that one of the members of that youth group happened to be a lawyer. And the lawyer, you know what lawyers are like. The lawyer said, yes, she promised to become a bhikkhuni, but she didn't say when. <laughs> so said, yeah, I'll become a bhikkhuni in 50 years' time <laughs> or something. But anyway, how do you do those things? It's just the kindness. The kindness, the softness, that does have a power. And so anyway, you can use that even for your mind as well, to give it such kindness. That mind, if you just want to go off and think about something, fine, but just come back when you're finished. Then your mind doesn't go that far, ever. That's the way to overcome the restlessness. And the last one of these, in the Vitaka Santana Sutta, this is the one I find difficult to understand. You have to be really, really just the last resort and whatever you're trying to get involved in, something really gross. The other way to abandon unwholesome ideas or unwholesome things you are contemplating should clench your teeth with a tongue pressed up against the roof of your mouth and beat down, constrain and crush any such afflicting unwholesome motives. Have you ever done that? Does it work? <laughs> I don't think so either. You suppress it for a while. It has to be something which you just restrain yourself for doing something really, really, really bad and evil or uh, hurtful. Fair enough, but a lot of time that doesn't work at all. But never that's in there anyway. And that becomes part of the endeavor to abandon sort of unwholesome states of mind. And the third endeavor, on the right, um, Samawayama, the endeavor to develop. What is the endeavor to develop? Here you develop things like the enlightenment factor of mindfulness, these are the seven enlightenment factors. I think you all know what mindfulness is. The enlightenment factor of exploring the Dhamma. Sometimes people call that contemplating the Dhamma, which is like thinking about it, but thinking is not powerful enough to actually to become an enlightenment factor, which is why I prefer calling it exploring it. What do we mean by exploring the Dhamma? What we mean by exploring the Dhamma is that I pick up whatever I have around here and I say, what is this? What is this? Yeah? Is that what it is? It's much more than a saucer. You can use this for all sorts of other things. If you say it's a saucer and you think you've captured it, you don't look any deeper. It's not a right answer, 
That's the problem with getting a right answer or a wrong answer. It means we've dealt with it. If you look at it more deeply, you can use this for all sorts of other things. You can use this as a stand for the... Yeah, that works really well. It was a bit lower. So you can use it for a stand. You can use it for, I don't know what else you can use. You use it for putting on top of your water so nothing falls in. You can use it sometimes, you know, when we have like an ant or a beetle or a cockroach or something, you can put it over it to actually to uh, make sure it doesn't get squashed and doesn't cause you any problem, can't crawl out. There's so many innovative things you can do with a source. Uh, so it's not just a source. What else is it? You, when you contemplate something, you look deeper than just trying to give something a name until after a while you can see things in this which people have never seen before. Remember, I think there was in this one book about mindfulness and contemplation and many years ago this guy wanted to work with this naturalist who was doing amazing work exploring plants and species around our world and he wanted to be a disciple of his. So his test to see whether he was smart enough to be uh, a student of this great professor, the professor just got a fish out of a bottle, you know, a pickled fish, put it on the bench and said, tell me when you've uh, learnt everything about this fish. And then the professor went away, came back at lunchtime and asked the student if he finished it. He said, no, it's amazing. The more I look, the more I see. Great. Go and have lunch and come back in the afternoon. And he came back the next day, and the next day, and the next day, after about a week. Just looking at a pickled fish, could still see more every day. And he said, I can use someone like you. This is what it means by exploring. Seeing things which no one else has seen before. Keep looking. Keep looking. Go beyond what you've been taught. And if you can do stuff like that, then you understand what exploring the Dhamma really is. An enlightenment factor of energy. The energy which comes up, I was talking about that yesterday, about when the energy really starts to uh, improve in your meditation. I was actually last night I was talking about that to the kids. Please don't keep on working on your computer when you know you're tired. You need to re-energize yourself, otherwise you waste so much time. You're doing a job when you've got no energy to do it. And you've got no oomph to be able to do it, even if you're doing some gardening or something. When you're doing gardening, it's just not a job you do. You've got to put your heart into it, you're really into it. You've got energy to do it. And I don't mean just taking a cup of tea or a cup of coffee or something, or a Red Bull or whatever. You really see the energy coming up from within you. And the enlightenment factor of not just energy, of rapture. This is pity. It's a very beautiful sense of joy. And the enlightenment factor of tranquility. This is powerful where it's not just through rapture, but through the peace, the tranquility, which is caused by that rapture. You're really involved in something, so you're not just looking for something else to do. The tranquility, you don't need to do anything more. You have that tranquility, and from that tranquility, the stillness. This is actually developing what we call the, the jhanas. Energize, rapture, really still, or tranquil and still. And the enlightenment factor of equanimity, again, that word equanimity, I much prefer the word contentment. Every one of which is based upon seclusion, being apart from things, fading away in cessation, maturing in release. That's the cause he called the endeavor to develop. And what is the endeavor to maintain? Here you keep in mind an arisen meditation object that generates stillness. Whatever actually works for you. Some people just have a lot of success just recollecting the Buddha or the Dhamma or the Sangha. Some people reflect on a skeleton or loving kindness or the breath or a nimitta. These are meditation objects which one can use. 
So this is actually how one puts those skillful effort, not just force, not just striving, but the skillful methods of abandoning, uh, or not allowing unwholesome states to come into the mind. If they do come into the mind, knowing how they can uh, leave the mind easily, maintaining good states of mind, and making sure that once good states of mind are arisen, they can stay there for a long time. And you know, those are some of the best ways of abandoning unwholesome states, by having good states in the mind. The best way to keep your house safe from invasion by burglars or others is to have good people in the house. And the presence of good people in the house keeps the bad ones away. And that's one of the reasons why the best ways of this right endeavor is to be able to develop positive states of mind inside of you. And those positive states of mind are much better than to get rid of unwholesome states. If you have a lot of loving kindness inside of you, then things like anger or desires don't come up. When you feel like you have enough, what more do you want? Then you're peaceful. So those become that the Samawayama, the right endeavor. And I think, uh, hopefully, you can get the point that right effort or the right striving doesn't really uh, match how the Buddha um, described these wonderful four things to cultivate the mind. And then later what happens, I'm just uh, summing up here, once that right endeavor has purified the mind enough, then you can do the things like the four satipatthanas, the right mindfulness. And from the four satipatthanas, then you can go deep into the meditations. They just happen whether you like them or not. Of course you like them. But this is what happens. Each of the four focuses of mindfulness always begin with having restrained the five hindrances. This is actually the job of the right um, restraint, the right endeavor to weaken those five hindrances so much that you can be mindful. And the mindfulness gets stronger so you can get into the deep meditations. So I don't know if that worked for you. I know it's mostly the word of Ajahn Brahm instead of the word of the Buddha, but it's based on the word of the Buddha and it's, that's the core of it. So, now I hope we get some questions from you. Questions, comments or complaints? Eddie, I must get some questions. Yes, thank you. Oh, oh now they're running away from the mic. Thank you, Eddie. Ajahn Brahm, <clears throat> just now you said mentioned about the seven factors of enlightenment, yeah. and the factor of the enlightenment, enlightenment factor of equanimity. You know, is that equanimity equivalent to the realization of emptiness? It can be that equanimity can come from many of the realizations. Of emptiness is one of them, but. The equanimity itself, to me, that doesn't feel the best translation of that word. This is an intense happiness, a great joy. So I prefer something which is not as cold as equanimity. And these days prefer the word contentment. Because mm. contentment is something which is also is a more joyful, more beautiful, more attractive quality than equanimity. And I know years and years ago, many people would criticize, oh, you Buddhists are just so equanimous, as if we don't care. And that word equanimity can sometimes have that feeling of almost like uh, being a psychopath. Mm -hmm. You're equanimous too much. You don't react enough. You don't do what needs to be done. But the idea of contentment is something which is more beautiful. Anyway, that's just a personal preference. Mm. But it can come from many, many things. Mm. Not just from, uh, from emptiness. Mm. It can come from 
quite a few other of these qualities which we develop in meditation. Mm. Emptiness is one of them. Mm. Just, just, it's okay, one more? Quickly. Yeah, please. Oh. Yeah. You know, they, they say about bliss and emptiness. No? What? And bliss and emptiness. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, especially when you, you know. So, in this um, equanimity, you know. Yeah. I, and I just think, you know, I, I remember like a. Is equanimity the highest jhana? It is the fourth jhana. A fourth. And sometimes yeah. it's a little bit sort of uh, contradictory at first because. In equanimity, you're supposed to be beyond just you know, the happiness and suffering. But nevertheless, the Buddha actually calls it sometimes uh, upeka sukha, the joy of equanimity. Mm. It's almost like the joy of no joy, of beyond joy. In other words, it's still a, just a different type of happiness. Each one of these things is best described as like an emotional experience, not an a intellectual experience. The intellectual experience of equanimity can appear to be just dry, cold, frozen, with no real um, meaning for other people or for oneself even. But when it's like a contentment, which is describing, trying to describe the joy of equanimity, it's an emotional state, a very high, peaceful, pure mm. emotion of just being so at peace with the world. Other people may feel you're not reacting, but inside of you, it's gorgeous. Mm. One of the highest happinesses. Mm. I don't know if that makes the point. No, I do. No, no, yeah. I, sometimes, as a practitioner, no, okay? Yeah. We, um, we are well, far from the uh, the higher state, you know. Can we experience some some joy in, in our meditation, meditation too? Some little bliss must that arises. Yeah, of course. Mm. The more joy you feel, the the quicker that joy comes up in the meditation, the better. Mm. Again, that is why just the meditations which I do teach try and generate that joy as soon as possible. The joy of relaxation when you're meditating. And that's, you know, what I always pause there before you go off into the, the realm of the mind. Just like peace. How joyful is peace? You're sitting here, you're not in nimittas or jhanas yet. But it feels really nice. Really peaceful, blissful even. And that can get really, really deep. Mm. And when you get things like the breathing, you're watching the breathing. The Buddha always said that that's... The, Fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth factors of the eighth of the uh, Anapanasati. That's breathing in, breathing out, noticing the bliss, the joy, the happiness of the meditation. That's why the meditation becomes incredibly joyful. And I always mention that the standard of this to say what type of happiness this is on retreats. I'm sure this happens at Ajahn Bhamadi's retreats as well. You get to the point before lunch. And people are, some people are meditating in the hall and they know they're going to miss lunch. They carry on meditating. And they know that, you know that they're going to go hungry, but they'd rather carry on meditating, the joy of the meditation, than have anything to eat, even though they're not going to eat them for the rest of the day. So that's the sort of happiness it is. It's delightful. You don't want to sacrifice it for a meal. And that's important. And I know that some people, I was scared of the joy of meditation when I was young. I thought, this is supposed to be a religion. Religions aren't supposed to be fun. You know, religions are supposed to be ascetic. And you're told you're going to go to hell. And you've got to be, do this and do that. That was the religions which I was exposed to when I was a small child. And to actually to feel you can just bliss out when you're doing the best and the highest of religious practices, that was really quite challenging. Mm. But that's what's supposed to happen. Mm. If more people could okay. get those beautiful, blissful states mm. of mind in meditation, mm. of course, you know, more people would be Buddhists mm. and be happier, beautiful human beings. So, Ajahn the bliss is that feeling you know, in, like in your chest 
the nice feeling. That's the bliss, isn't it? It's more than that, but that's a good mm. start. Oh. It really takes over and it's not your body, it comes from your mind. Mm. Mm -hmm. I, I really understand. And that's why many people have this. Mm. That you have these beautiful states of meditation when you're a lay person. And that makes you, the only danger I keep saying, you may lose your hair. You just, <laughs> you just want to be, a, to renounce. Mm. It's just, it's more fun. Mm. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Yeah, okay, yes. Great. Hi. Hello. Uh, Ajan, uh, about second factor of uh, yeah. the noble life purpose, uh, the right motivation, is yeah. it is said that right motivation will cheese on the uh, second jhana. So is it uh, the right motivation <laughs> based on will or? No, it's just all motivation ceases in the second jhana. It's only the ceasing when you're in the jhanas, when you come out again, the motivations are very, very pure. It ceases without remainder within the second and higher jhanas. And the reason that happens is because you are so still. You don't need motivation anymore. That thing which we know as motivation stops. Nothing moves. So you can't motivate anything. Not even the most beautiful things. You've already arrived in stillness. So motivation can't be in stillness. Did I explain myself well enough? Because in that second jhana, that's one of the uh, real features of it. It's where you really know that you're in this beautiful state of awareness, very joyful, but then nothing moves, and you can't move. It's like there's no mouse to press, there's no button to depress, there's no switch to turn. All of those things are just not there for you. You're still, like frozen, beautifully aware, but you can't do anything. That's why you can sit in that for hours. You just, nothing to, no way of coming out. You don't mind, you're having a wonderful time. The mind is being purified within there. So when that ceases, after its time, then when you come out afterwards, the motivations are very powerful, very beautiful. Does that make sense? Not really? Please be honest. <laughs> uh, how about the restraint? Is there a, how to uh, separate restraint from, from will or? Oh yeah. This was one of the little pieces of info from Professor Libet that uh, psychologist or whatever he calls himself, but it is really fascinating science on the nature of the will. And now he would often say this, what we take to be free will is not free will, we're so conditioned beings. We're influenced by things outside of us. And But then he did some more experiments and he came up with the conclusion, not as a Buddhist or a meditator, but just as a scientist, there's no such thing as free will, but there is free won't. Just the ability to say no, to stop a course of thought, to stop a series of intentions, to say no. And I kind of was fascinated with that idea because a lot of time that, you know, we have these stories of Angulimala, stop, no. Or we have these, that story of that novice, seven-year-old, eight-year-old novice, and what, no, I think it was older than that, nine or ten-year-old, who was so bored with Ajahn Chah's talk, 
and kept on thinking, when is Ajahn Chah going to stop? When's he going to stop? When's he going to stop? And then turn that around to say, when am I going to stop? And that's when the novice stopped. And it came out of his first experience of jhana many hours later. Just out of his head. These things happen. It's not free will, but free want. The ability to say no, to stop, to restrain. So the real restraint is uh, came from jhana. From jhana, no, just that's the result of restraining. From jhana, you see what happens when you restrain. You get still. You get great beauty. Most joyful, beautiful experience you've ever had. Until you have a second jhana, that's more beautiful than the third and the fourth. Okay. Okay. Any more questions? Oh, yeah, there is one. Okay, great. So, just to clarify, um, in the first jhana, there are still motivations. It's they're wholesome. Yeah. And maybe they're like automatic or something. Yes, they're automatic. Those motivations are especially that which moves your mind back into the object the vitaka. And the reason why that is slightly unstable is because you hold the object, that's the vichara. And this is just a metaphor, you're not f you know, physically determined and intentionally holding it. It's just this is the nature of the mind at that time, almost an automatic. Has not got enough confidence, trust in what it's experiencing. And just uh, automatically holds, so you move back again. And then that going back into the object again, that's like a motivation. Holding on to it is like kind of a wrong motivation, not necessary. Well, it's hardly any motivation at all. Just a last glimmer of motivation. And, and then, so, and then the cessation of the un unwholesome ones at first jhana, is that yeah. because of the cessation of sense perception in general? Correct, or? yes. The five senses have disappeared. You are apart from that. In a different world. Okay, have I gone too deep again? Okay. I was enjoying what I was saying anyway. So... And it's almost 4.20, coming up to 4.30. So if there's no more questions, shall we call it an afternoon, not a day? When we asked to go yet. Okay. So, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay. So now we usually bow three times to Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha, and then we can... Uh, finish off or do whatever we need to do.